this for Terry Blumeyer, who was one of the founding members of this church. Quite a few of you were there that day. I'd never met Terry, but you know, by the end of his funeral, I really wish I had. Listening to Terry's story, one of the things that struck me was the impact of what was really a very ordinary life, a life just like yours and mine, an ordinary life that God used to touch so many people. The other thing that struck me was just how much the world had changed through Terry's lifetime. That was one of the things we realized when the Queen died, wasn't it? How much life has changed since the 1950s. I think we've got a picture. Do you remember school milk and those cardigans and pullovers? Or do you remember those enormous mobile phones? It, well, some of you do. That was the late 80s, the early 90s, I think, and it only seems like yesterday, isn't it? Life has changed, and it's not just in technology. People's attitudes, people's values, people's assumptions have changed too. Society's changing, and it keeps on changing, it seems, at an ever faster pace. We have a friend who's lived and worked in Turkey for the last 30 years, supporting the church there. And as she begins to think forward about retirement, she wonders how she's ever going to fit back in the UK, and even back into church here, because things have changed so much. It sometimes feels as if we're living in a different world, doesn't it? And it can all feel a bit discombobulating and a bit alien, which is just a bit how the first readers of the letter to the Hebrews that we've been reading this morning were feeling. They felt like resident aliens in a society that was becoming increasingly hostile to Christian faith. They'd lost their founding members, the leaders they'd relied on, and it was an uphill struggle sometimes to keep going. For those besieged believers, the reminders that in the midst of a changing and sometimes hostile world, that God does not change, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, it was a lifeline, it was an anchor, and we sang that at Terry's funeral too. Knowing that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever was an anchor that brought encouragement and strength to Christians who were being tempted to abandon the race of faith altogether, some of them, and if not give up altogether. The other real temptation they faced was to turn in on themselves, to circle the wagons, and you have to be a certain age even to understand that image, to circle the wagons, to disengage from the world and protect what they've got. But what does it mean to say that God doesn't change? What does it mean to say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Does it mean that if Jesus walked into church today, he'd be in Middle Eastern clothes, 2,000 years old, and be wearing open-toed sandals, or maybe the sandals, but the rest? Before we go on, it's important to notice here what the New Testament says about Jesus. Back at the beginning of this letter to the Hebrews, we discover some words that we'll read in a minute and I hope you might find just ever so slightly familiar because they're the words that we've just heard used in Psalm 102 where they are used to describe Almighty God. And then in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 10, they are used to describe Jesus, about the Son, God says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. Do you notice what's being said here? Jesus Christ is the one whose years will never end. Jesus Christ is God, almighty God, with skin on. That supreme revela revelation, the very embodiment of God. And that understanding of Jesus isn't just confined to the letter to the Hebrews. It's there throughout the New Testament. We've heard bits of it already quoted in Colossians and all over the place. 
in Jesus, the eternal God has taken on human flesh. God walking among us in Jesus. Jesus is God in a human life that we can see and touch and be touched by. And that is utterly amazing. And it's because Jesus is the eternal Son of God that we can say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Sometimes when I bump into somebody I haven't seen for quite a while, they say something like, you haven't changed a bit. And of course, what I want to say to them is, I think you probably need to go and get your eyes tested, because it's patently obvious I have. But of course, what they're really saying is, you're still the same person. You're still the same Susan I got to know all those years ago. To say that Jesus Christ is the same doesn't mean that Jesus Christ is static and stale and old-fashioned and, dare I say, a bit boring. It means he is the same living, loving, forgiving person we see at work in the Gospels. So what is it about God that doesn't change? It is who God is. Who the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ reveals himself to be. And who is this God? He is the God of unfailing love. A few years ago, a good few years ago now, I had the opportunity at preaching at the baptism of our older son. His dad, and one of his youth leaders, did the baptizing and, and I got to preach. And you know, an opportunity like that concentrates the mind. Some of you have been involved, I suspect, in baptizing some of your children. It does, doesn't it? It makes you think what it is that we want our children to know above all else as they make their way through life. Above all else, I want them to know that whatever life brings, whatever mistakes they make, however wrong they go, there is always the rock of God's unfailing love there beneath their feet, always there for them to plant their feet back on. What I want them and every person in the world to know is that there is nothing that can ever stop God from loving them. Nothing that we can ever say or think or do or become can ever stop God from loving us. There's a children's song we used to sing way back in the day, which said, you can't stop rain from falling down, prevent the sun from shining. You can't stop winter coming in or summer from resigning. And just as you can't stop the rain from falling or the sun from shining, so it goes on, you can't stop God from loving you. Do you just want to stop and take that in for a moment? You can't stop God from loving you. Not God, not now, not ever. That's what never changes. It's what the Bible calls hesed, the steadfast love, the loving faithfulness of God the warm, powerful, compassionate love that we celebrate when we quote those famous words from Lamentations chapter 3. You can say them with me, I guess. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What is it about God that doesn't change? It's the unfailing love of God of God, which provides a firm foundation for life and which will never let us go. I don't know whether you have a, a bucket list, any of you. Um, there are a number of experiences, I have to say, that I'm quite happy to leave off <laughs> my bucket list. And yeah, skydiving is one of them, but, that, but I have a strong suspicion there'll be somebody here who's done it. Do we have people? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, you are an intrepid lot. You are more intrepid than I am, and I am in awe of you. But 
Well, I know that you can do it, strapped to an instructor who knows what they're doing. But if I tell you that we're at that stage in life where every time we get into the car to go somewhere, one of us goes back to check that we've locked the front door, <laughs> do you think that I would trust that an instructor had strapped me on properly or that the parachute really would open at the right time? And trusting God can feel a bit like that, can't it? Can God really be trusted? It's the age-old question. It's the question that wormed its way into Eve's heart back in the garden. Can God really be trusted? How do we know? We know supremely because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. On the cross, as Jesus died, we see the love of God tested to the uttermost. I know some people who would say that at times, the only thing that's enabled them to keep on believing has been Jesus' cry of dereliction from the cross. You know, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He cries out. God, where are you? Why can't I feel you now when I need you most? In the life of Jesus and supremely in his death, we see the love of God tested to the uttermost and it does not fail. And what's more, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, it's God who binds himself to us. It's not so much what we have to do, but what God has done. In the death and resurrection of Jesus, God binds himself to us with this love that will never fail. What is it about God that doesn't change? It's God's unfailing love and it's God's life-giving hope. It's a very personal hope. I said at Terry's funeral that every time I walk down the aisle, as a minister does quite regularly in front of a coffin, I can't help but think, one day, this will be me. And it will. And I have to confess that I don't have lots of images of what the journey from life through death will be like. But what I do know is that when I slip from this life, I will be met by the love of God that we see in Jesus, the love we were made for, the love that we taste here and now, and will know in its fullness then. But this life-giving hope isn't just for the next life. It's hope for this life, here and now, hope for us and hope for all. Jesus came that we and all God's children might have life, and life in all its fullness. John 10.10, 10, if you want to look it up. The last Sunday I was here, I mentioned that uh, the previous Friday, I'd been up to London to the Climate Action Day, do you remember? Organised, among others, by Tear Fund, by Christian Aid, by CAFOD and others. I went partly because in partnership with BMS World Mission, I've had the opportunity to visit uh, islands in the Ganges Delta, small islands, where people live on land which at best is just at or just below sea level. And as the sea levels rise, those communities are being swamped. They're being washed away and millions more families will be made to leave their homes. They will join the displaced. The UNHCR estimates that this year, 2023, there will be, listen to this, try and um, imagine it, 117.2 million people forcibly displaced. Each one of those people a much-loved child of God. And I know there are no easy answers. But I was struck at the Climate Change Day. I was struck that our BMS banner was the only banner I saw that spoke about hope. 
all of the others said things like climate action now, no more fossil fuel, you know? And, and, and yes, even without easy answers, those things need to be said. But what struck me so forcefully that day was that what people so desperately need in this regard and in every other area of life, what people most need is hope, life-changing hope. It was Bill Hybels who once said, the local church is the hope of the world. Now, you and I would say that we thought that job had gone already, wouldn't we, to Jesus. You know, Jesus is the hope of the world. But Bill Hybels is right too. Jesus came that we and all God's people might have life and life in all its fullness. And the job of the church is to show the rest of the world, like those beacons that we were flashing around, the job of the church is to show the rest of the world what that life in all its fullness looks like. To be a living model of the difference that knowing and trusting God makes. Which is why I find this 13th chapter of Hebrews so exciting. Because yes, it reminds us that God doesn't change, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it also reminds us that what God expects of us as followers of Jesus doesn't change either. We are called as church to live together in such a way that people see what God is really like. In such a way that people can taste and touch and trust God's love for them. We're called to be a community that models a, a different and attractively different, a positively different way to live and to make it easier for people to believe. And what that means, well, some of it's spelled out in Hebrews chapter 13, things like, verse one, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Someone once said, I want no more of your talk of forgiveness. I want to see a community where forgiveness is happening and changing how people live. Things like in verse 2, do not forget to welcome the strangers. Remember those who are in prison as if you were their fellow prisoner and those who are mistreated as if you yourself were suffering. Demonstrate God's warm compassion. Marriage should be honoured by all and the marriage bed kept pure. God is faithful to you, so you be faithful to one another in all your relationships. And equally, keep your life free from the love of money. Now, there's a sermon, there's at least one in all of those different things, isn't there? But it comes down to God's call to us to live differently, to be an attractively different, welcoming community where God's love can be felt and touched and trusted, not primarily telling the world where it's getting it wrong, so much as showing the world a better way to live. We began by remembering Terry and his impact on so many just before Christmas, we were in Northern Ireland for my sister-in-law's funeral, Peter's older brother's wife, Philomena, Phil. Phil was a lovely Catholic Christian woman with a very strong faith that life had tested. The church was full for her funeral too. And at one stage in the sermon, the priest referred to Phil as one of the Anna Weem. The Anawim in the Bible were the little people, not the Irish little people, the fairies, you know, but the ordinary people. People like Mary and Joseph and Anna and Simeon and Jesus too, I guess. Not the apparently powerful, but the ordinary people. Ordinary people like Phil and like Terry and like most of us the ordinary people God works through. Remember your leaders, our reading concludes, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. I wonder who are the people who've influenced you? 
I think of the vicar of the church in Bolton where I began to go as a teenager who became a father in God to so many young people of my generation. I think of my mother-in-law, Olive Helen Stevenson, a village primary school teacher, a mother, a grandmother who influenced more lives for God than she would ever realize. I think of some of the characters we knew in South London, many of them without the benefit of much education at all, but whose faith and love have impacted me so deeply and they'd probably never have guessed it. Ordinary people, glowing with God's love, deeply rooted in the unfailing love and life-giving hope of Jesus, and used by God to touch people's lives. The sort of people, the kind of community we're called to be, and that by God's grace we can be. Because God's unfailing love and his life-giving hope aren't just ideas to be thought about. They are realities to be experienced and absorbed and lived in. And as in a few moments we come to share communion together, we come to the place where Jesus loved us to the uttermost, to the place where God promises to meet with us and to share with us that love, that forgiveness, his very heart and his very self. And where we come to do the only thing we can do, to receive and gladly surrender afresh to him, to this God of steadfast. And as we move towards sharing communion now, we're going to sing. We're going to sing very simply those words from Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's remain seated while we sing.